Hello everybody, good evening, welcome to the United Stands, I'm Mark Goldbridge and this is your latest Manchester United news as Marcus Rashford looks highly likely to be staying at Manchester United with PSG not interested. Also, we're going to be talking about the big developments of the day, Doogie Friedman, sporting director of Crystal Palace, about to be appointed as head of recruitment for Manchester United. What does that mean? What's it all about? Shake it all about. We'll talk about it. Also, we're going to be talking about Newcastle whacking a massive £20 million fee on Dan Ashworth. Where does that money come from? Is he worth it? We'll talk about that as well. Lots to get into on the show today. And of course, I just want to say a big shout out to everybody. We put a different style of video up this afternoon, um, basically talking about Anthony. A brutally honest uh, opinion on why Anthony's been a bad signing. Um, check it out on the on the homepage. Really enjoyed doing something a little bit different uh, on a player that apparently we are part of his PR for. So uh, always remember, everything else is just noise, external noise. For 10 years, we have been saying it how it is. And now apparently other people say it how it is and we don't. Pretenders, sit down. We will always say it how it is. We're not on anyone's PR role. It's just jealousy and bitterness. And watch the video on Anthony, because if I'm on the payroll, I've just been sacked and got me P45. We'll check the video out. Anyway, lovely stuff. Uh, great show this morning as well. Really did enjoy it, PJ. And Gems has just gifted five men memberships. She's a legend. Thank you very much, Gems, and uh, get your badge in. Right, we're going to start off. Um, we'll start off on the Rashford story, because this is quite a big story that many people might not have noticed from today. Marcus Rashford is a massive story around Manchester United. And, you know, hopefully we're not going to get a tweet from him saying um, stop spreading malicious rumours because unfortunately, Marcus, it's not rumours. A lot of people want you to go. A lot of people don't think you're very good. A lot of people want to sell you. I don't want to do that. I'm not on the payroll, though. Um, but basically what 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 happened today is Julian Lorenz, who I think is ESPN, but he's a French journalist, was asked today on, I think it was on Talk Sport, uh, they were talking about killing Mbappe, and he was asked about the likelihood of Rashford going to Manchester, leaving Manchester United and going to PSG. This is what he said. He said, at this moment in time, Marcus Rashford is not on the five-man shortlist to replace Kylian Mbappe. And I think based upon that, it's very fair to say he's not on the shortlist and he's not going to be going to PSG. Now, look, this is the problem. This is the problem that people don't realise. Marcus Rashford, Mank born and bred, loves the club. We've seen the interview. Man United love him. We've seen the obsession. This is our problem to solve. And I've been saying this for a long time. It's not as simple as sell him when nobody wants to buy him. And, you know, I didn't want to be that blunt because I just think it might get misread the wrong way. But when I've been saying I wouldn't sell Rashford in the summer, if I'm being completely honest, it's because nobody will bloody buy him. I'm just being a realist. Nobody's going to buy him. There's a lot of you who say sell him. There's a lot of people very angry and fed up with him. There's a lot of people who like him who just don't think he's good enough. But he's on £350,000 a week or around that. Um, he's our best paid player. And he's only one year into that contract. He is unsellable. Ineos can come in and spin and shout and PR and bring in good people but they can't sell Marcus Rashford. They can't solve that issue. Um, and it is an issue that ha can only be solved by Marcus Rashford finding something that some people think he doesn't have. Consistent 90-minute performances week in, week out is the only way to solve this issue. And that's why when I say don't sell him, it's because I know the only solution is that he actually starts playing well consistently week in, week out. Because that's what we pay him, that's what we pay him to do. Um, he is unsellable. Whether he wants to go, whether United want him to go, he is unsellable because nobody wants him. And um, that's the bottom line. And, 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 and it's interesting because I actually remember talking about this a couple of weeks ago and thinking, well, there will be clubs that would buy Marcus Rashford. And there would be clubs that would buy Marcus Rashford, but not at the price and the wage that we would demand. So he ain't going anywhere. Um and we've got to find a way of solving it. You know, it's sad as well in a way because I saw, um, I don't know why I, I, I was on social media. That's probably why. I um, It just randomly came up the goal uh, he scored in the Manchester derby. And I never get to listen to the audio because I'm doing a watch along. So, you know, I'm reacting to 
goals without sound. And I heard the audio of it today and it just makes it even better, let's be honest. And uh, I was just like, oh, what a goal. And it was a good goal. And, and what a moment after that interview. And I was like, oh, you know, even when, it, when I watched the goal back today, I was like, wow, what a goal. And then you remember what came after. And even with that goal, many people felt he had a bad performance and he was called out. Um, so, look, it's a big, big problem to solve, but it's our problem to solve. He's not going anywhere. Um, Gems, uh, Gifted Five membership. When the going gets tough, uh, Ten Hag gets rough. Ten Hag in, says Nathan Kearney. Um, what is the shortlist? Uh, Raphael Leal is on that list. Um, Osman's on that list. Um, there's some young player from Lille that they're looking at as well, apparently. Um and I can't remember who the other two are, but it's not. Marcus Rashford's not on that list, unfortunately. Uh, SRC says, uh, Rashford is not good enough for a top eight team in the Premier League. Why would any decent club want him with wage demands and carry one off the pit, uh, carry ons off the pitch? Well, you know, whether that's true or not, it might be a reason why clubs aren't looking at him. But um, look, it, it, we this is Manchester United's problem to solve. And as I've always said all season, the best way this gets solved is that Marcus Rashford starts scoring games week in, week out. Because the problem that he's got is that if he doesn't start scoring goals between now and the end of the season, and then Ten Hag gets sacked and he starts doing it next year, I think people have seen through it now. They, you saw it with the Manchester derby goal. He scores a great goal. And then at the end of the game, people are saying, well, one goal in a derby isn't enough. We need a good performance. And I think that if he has a really bad season... And then he has a good season next year under a new manager. I just don't think people are going to buy into it anymore. I think they're going to see that this is a player that can switch it on and off, depending on you know whether he likes the manager or not. Because that's that's the perception. Switched it off for Ranjik and Oli. Switched it on for Ten Hag year one. Switches it off again. New manager comes in this summer, switches it on again. Um, so look, we, we need a solution. And I think the best solution is that Rashford starts scoring goals now between now and the end of the season for this manager. That's the solution, in my opinion. Hi, Mark. I just found out I'll be going to my first United match against Newcastle in April, says Ash. Are there any pubs you would recommend going to before or after the match? Keep up the good work. Well, the Bishop's Blaze, I think is a, I think you have to have a ticket to get in there, and it's a it's a rowdy affair. Um, uh, there's the one at the top of St. Ab Busby Way. I think it's just simply called the Trafford. Um they're very, very close. They're very, very close to it. Um, is Friedman coming in tandem with Wilcox, says Graham Outerbridge. It sounds like a line from a porno. Uh, he's not talking about porn. He's talking about the big news today that Doogie Friedman, who is the sporting director for Crystal Palace, is going to be appointed as Manchester United's head of recruitment. Now, this won't come as a big a shock as it might have done because he actually has been linked to us for about three months he was being linked to us before Christmas um, as a potential director of football um, what are your thoughts on Doogie Friedman as our sporting uh, head of recruitment um, well look first of all I think the um, I think the um, the really the really interesting thing is that when you look at Doogie Friedman and, and, and look this is just an article I was reading earlier on I know some of the players that he's bought I think he bought Sacco um, there's a few players that he's bought, but they basically listed his top five signings as um, as a Crystal Palace director, football sporting director. Um, and I, there's definitely a theme here. Michael Alisi, he brought in as a, as a young winner, winger from Reading in 2021 for 8.3 million. Uh, Ezzy, he bought in from QPR for 20 million in August 2020. Um, Gwehi, he got from Chelsea on a five year deal for 18 million quid. Um, uh, Anderson, who's a centre-back I really like. He brought him in from Fulham. Um, and um, I think the other one he brought in that's done really well, but he's been injured for most of the season, is that lad Decore, who um, uh, they got in from... I think they got him in from Lens. So, look, what I would say about Doogie Friedman is that there is a definite... Um, there is a definite style to what he does. And he he is predominantly buying young talent from within the this country. Um, Anderson's not particularly young, but um, he was playing for a Premier League club. Uh, with the exception of Decore, it's a lot of young talent from the Premier League, um, which, to be honest with you, isn't necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I, I, I think this is interesting from Manchester United. I do. I, I think his, his talent recruitment is really good for Crystal Palace. But Man United's not Crystal Palace. That, that, that's, there has to be a but. 
if there's not a but, then we're really naive. There always has to be a but because we have to hold people who run this football club accountable and we can't just lap it up like a dog. We've, we've, got, to, we've got to put a but in there. Um, it looks to me with the Dan Ashworth deal that they're trying to get done and the Doogie Friedman deal that they're trying to get done, it looks to me like United are heading down this young recruitment um, avenue. And I haven't got a problem with it because when you look at it this season, you could argue that Mainu, Rasmus and Ganacho have been at three of our best players. So I've got no problem with it. But what I do, I think that is absolutely essential is I do not want to walk down the myth light. There's, 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 been, there's been this attachment to Ineos that I don't want to do. I don't, I don't want it to be true. And I don't think it is true. But ever since Ineos have been linked to Man United, there's been talk about Brexit, um, British players. And I don't want that. I, I don't think anybody wants that. I don't want us to be just predominantly buying young British talent. Because I just don't think that's ever been a, a recipe for success. In the entirety of the Premier League's history, there's not one club that's been built predominantly on young British talent. Um, you know, even, the closest we've ever come to that was probably the class of 92, where you've got five or six young British players. Um, but you already had the Cantonars, the Keens, the Bruce, the Schmeichels, the people like Dennis Irwin and people like that. So I don't want that to happen. I don't think it will happen. But if I had to have a but about Friedman and Ashworth it, and, and, and Sir Jim and Sir David Brailsford was that it's just very British. It feels very British and I don't want our recruitment to be very British, which sounds stupid because I'm English. So therefore I'm British. But I just don't want us to be exclusively obsessed with British talent. I, I don't. I really don't. And Michael Elise is not British, by the way. I think he's actually French. But um, and. But yeah, I, I don't want that. That's the only but I would have. Um, I like the appointment of Barada because I think he's best in class. Um, but everybody else looks like Wilcox, Friedman, Ashworth. It's all very British. And and that's absolutely fine as, as long as the, the recruitment is worldwide. I don't want us to buy predominantly British players because you're just boxing yourself off and trying to, you know... we. It would be weird to have that type of a mentality where you're like, we just want to buy British. It'd be stupid. You'd be cutting your nose off to bite your face. And I don't think it will happen. I really, really don't. So, and also, it's a big step up for someone like Doogie Friedman. Crystal Palace is not Manchester United. I would say it's a bit of a shocking uh, appointment in the sense that it's a shock. Not that it's a bad shock. But I think recruiting Doogie Friedman from Crystal Palace to head of recruitment for Manchester United, it's a big step. It is a big step. And there's a lot of excitement about it. I think it's exciting, but it is a big step. Um, Mark, you could look at it and say he's done very well on a shoestring budget. Maybe he could do even better with more resources, says Matt G. And and and, and hopefully that'll be the case. And when you look at someone like Dan Ashworth at Brighton and at Newcastle, it's not been predominantly British. They have bought British players, but there has been foreign signings as well. And I think that's really important. Um, Pap says, I'd like Paul Mitchell. He's British. Yeah, but Paul Mitchell spent most of his career outside of Britain, hasn't he? You know, he's been at Leipzig. He's been at Monaco. Um, look, I, I just don't want Man United to go down the path of British players. I don't. Um, and some people will think that's weird, but I just really don't want us to do it. I don't think it's the way forward. And I think if you look at our success, you know, I don't think that's the way to do it. I, I really don't. But um, I also would say his recruitment of Ezzy, Gwehi, Elisi, he can't buy those sort of players from Man United. You can't buy Elisi from Reading. You can't buy Ezzy from QPR. You can't buy Gwehi from the Chelsea youth system. We've got to buy them from Crystal Palace. So it's, you're right. It's a different type of recruitment, isn't it? We can't buy those types of players because we're Manchester United. Um, we've got to buy players that are ready. We can't be buying players that are an if, but, or a maybe. So much pressure on young British lads coming to a club like United. Kobe is doing brilliantly, but can't think it will always be that way, says uh, Josh. And Threefold Path says, um, if they bought in Ashworth and Friedman, then one could focus on domestic recruitment for homegrown quota, while the other focuses on foreign players. And this is a really good point from Threefold Path, because we do need to buy British players, because there is a homegrown, rule, homegrown ruling. Um, I just wouldn't want it to become the fundamental core of what we're trying to do. Because actually, I don't think there's enough good British players to win you a Premier League title. Um, you know, if you look at the, the, the good British players at the moment, we'll never get our hands on them. Declan Rice at Ar Arsenal, Bellingham's at Real Madrid, Foden is at Manchester City. Um, 
there's not going to be another three or four of those players coming through in the next two years. So I think you've got to have a mixed bag. Of course you have. Uh, so much pressure. We've done that one from Threefold Path. Um, and also, no matter what Rashford does, some have made their mind up as International 2675. Well, have they? is there not enough evidence for people to make their mind up? I, don't, I also think change, my, minds can be changed. Uh, do you think that Rashford is playing for Ten Hag's as Terence? I don't know. I, I, you know. You know what? That deserves a bigger build up. I, I, you know what? This is a big. You've put me on right on the spot there, um, and I won't not answer it. Do you think Marcus Rashford is playing for Ten Hag? Well, it's a big, big, big statement to say I don't think he is. It's a very big statement to say I don't think Marcus Rashford is playing for this manager. Um. That's a big, that's a big step because you're basically saying that he's downing tools and sabotaging the club that he loves. Um, could it not be just so simple that he's just not playing very well all season? Um, I don't like sitting on the fence. I think it's a great question, Terence. It's probably one of the best questions we've been asked in a long time because it's it, you can't hide. You've got to answer it. Do I think Marcus Rashford is giving everything for this manager? He will say yes. Ten Hag will say yes. The club will say yes. I will say I don't know. I don't know. And 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 the reason I will say that is because I'm massively confused by Rashford this year. It's it's basically been all season, August to March. He hasn't played well. It's not um it's not a bad it's not a rough patch. A rough patch can be six, seven weeks. This is all season. Um it's, it doesn't make any sense. So I don't know. I don't know. You know, the critics will say he was good friends with Sancho. And as soon as that happened, he wasn't interested in Ten Hag. Um, the critics will say the Belfast thing. There was probably been a, you know, fallout there. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Um, look, Players get very offended about this type of thing. And I completely understand it because you're questioning their professionalism. You're questioning their passion for the club. I think you can love a club and not play for a manager. Um, Chelsea did it to VS Boas. You know, John Terry and co. They um, they did it. You know, they, they loved Chelsea, but they downed tools for the manager, didn't they? I think John A.B. McCall was talking about it in a podcast. Um, but you could visibly see they were doing it. You know, as soon as the manager was gone, they started trying again. Look, Man United players did it to Mourinho. They're absolutely shit for four months. Mourinho gets sacked, Oli comes in, and we're suddenly unbeatable for three months. So, look, as much as it's offensive, it's also a fact that players stop giving it all, giving their all. And as I've said to you many times before, they're not not playing for the manager, they're not playing for you. But they don't figure that out. They think they love the club and they're doing it because they don't like the manager. But the manager manages the club and you're paid by the club. And if you don't play for the manager, you're not playing for the club. And if you don't play for the club, you're not playing for the fans. So I've always been of the opinion that if a player downs tools, they're downing tools for the fans because the fans suffer as much as the manager suffers. Um, there has been players at that club that have downed tools. We've seen it. Um, do I think that Marcus Rashford is playing for the manager? I don't know. I, I don't know. And, 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 and that's not saying I don't think he is. I would say this about a few Man United players, to be fair. I don't know because I've seen the bad results that are inexcusable over the last four or five years. And that has to be because players aren't giving their all. Um, I think Rashford's a very distinctive case because he's just so confusing. What, what an amazing talent. But where is it gone? For eight months, what? Why is it gone? I, I, I don't have the answer to that, um, and I think it's a big statement to say that you know he's not playing for the manager because, you know, you're you're, you're questioning. Well, he did the interview last week, so you know, I, you know, he's, he says completely the opposite. So, but there's something not. I, I don't, I don't get it. And um, I heard somebody saying something today, and it's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Um, I think it was Graham Soonis about Pogba actually. He said, for years, I've had so much shit because I've called out Paul Pogba. And he basically said, if I didn't think Paul Pogba was a good player, I never would have bothered calling him out. He said, the only reason I called Paul Pogba out is because I think he wasted his talent. And that's why 
I was obsessed with him, apparently. But that's why I always got on his back, because I actually thought he was a better player than he was. And, you know, that's what I think some players don't realise, is that when you're constantly being analysed, like Rashford is, for most of us, it's because we think he's a good player and it's just confusing why he's not been. Um, I bet some players will play worse just to sack Ten Hag, says Hayder. Well, they need calling out if we see it. Blaming Rashi for every bad, route, bad result is crazy to me, says Tevin. I don't think anybody has done that, Tevin. I don't, I don't think anybody's individualised it at all. Uh, Sammy, welcome to Members Club. Thank you very much for joining. Um, uh, Ab Abdirahman says, Rashford, poor performance in and out of the pitch. Big wage, let's act like any other club and sell him. Mate, to who? Espin says, I think it's worrying that we can't see if a player plays for the manager or not. And I think that's a great point as well. And and let's let's widen that out. You know, what's gone wrong with Bruno over the last two months? You know, it's not just Rashford. What's gone wrong with Bruno over the last two months? Um, there are others as well that aren't playing well. Why? What, what What's going on? Will our front four be our front four next season, says Grace. And uh, in your opinion, has Eric Ten Hag got the best out of the cards he was dealt with. Is sixth place the best anyone can get out of this squad, says International? Um, two questions to answer there. And I need to talk to you about uh, Dan Ashworth as well. Uh, do I think that the front three will be our front three next season? Look, I think Rashford, Rashford Hoyland and Ganacho does work quite well, but there's not enough creativity from the wings. Um, so I don't think it will be the front three next season. No. Uh but I wouldn't be surprised if it is. Uh, with regards to um, has Ten Hag got the best out of what he's got, it's an interesting one to answer because I think we are exactly where we should be. I think any lower than sixth is embarrassing. I think anything higher than sixth is um, optimistic. Um, and what I mean by that is Arsenal, Liverpool and uh, Manchester City are way better than us, but so are Spurs and Villa. Spurs and Villa are better than us. Like, but Spurs and Villa are able to put their best team out a lot more than we are. Like, look at Spurs the last few weeks. They've got a bench. They've got a really good starting eleven. Look at Villa. They, they can put a good team out. And they have had injuries. Both those teams have had injuries, but we've had injuries all season. So I think we are where we should be. I actually, you know, it's funny. I saw Beth retweeting some uh, AFTV thumbnails from a couple of years ago where Arsenal fans were angri angrily shouting Arteta out. I've mentioned before that Arsenal finished eighth twice with Arteta and stood by him. I think Man United and Ineos should be looking at that. And I think it's very arrogant to sack the manager and think they know better than a proven recent evidence that it's worth sticking with the manager. And we've never done that before. But they, they will make their choices. Of course they will. Um... But I, th I think it is interesting uh, to um, look at United where they are at the moment. And I think we're exactly where we should be. I don't think we've got any right to be above Villa or Spurs because they've been better than us this season. And I think the reason they've been better than us this season is because they're able to put a better team out than us for most of the season. Um, I think if we could have put out Martinez and Varane and Luke Shaw and Casemiro, Maynou and Bruno and Hoyland for most of the season... I think we'd be in fourth place. I think we'd be above Spurs and Villa. But we haven't. We've. I mean, how many games? Here's a great, here's a great quiz question for you. And notice I didn't mention Ganacho Rashford. I think we've got good cover on the wings. Um, and I didn't mention Delo because, you know, we have got Wambasaka when he's fit, but he's not. But I think if for the most of the season we could have played Varane, Martinez, Shaw, Casemiro, Maynou, Bruno, I think we would have been in fourth place. Um, I wouldn't be surprised... If we've if we've only started that those those players together once or twice this year, um, which is a big problem. Uh, I bet some players will play. I've done that one from Haddy. Mark, what are your predictions for the summer? Incomings and outgoings. Do you expect many marquee signings or surprising sales to Sebastian? Uh, I don't really want to talk about it, mate, because I think there's just so much um, that's going to happen before the summer, and I think predicting the summer is really silly because we just don't we just don't know a lot of things at the moment. Um, but as I was told last night. Don't expect many outgoings in the summer and don't expect any shock outgoings in the summer. The harsh reality about Man United is that many of our players are exhausted. Like Liverpool last season, we played in every game we could besides six Europa League games. City dodges exhaustion problem by always having the ball. Says Les. I, I think that's a great point. I'm getting some good points in tonight. 
we are getting some good points in tonight. Um, I think that you're right. I think that um, last season, there is a hangover from last season. A lot of players played a lot of football. Uh, Mark, you called Arteta a Poundland Pep during the old days when they were struggling, yet you're saying you always backed him. That's not always, mate, says Mario G. Yes, I did. Go back and check the videos. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, I think what you're doing is you're mixing up me taking the piss out of Arteta and Arsenal fans, but um, I was behind Arteta before, you know, even Arsenal fans came round to it. So, you know, there's, I think what you're getting mixed up with there is taking the piss out of a right. I took the piss out of Klopp at the start, but... I wanted, I'd have took him at United. Uh, Olu says, if we sack Ten Hag, does that mean we would not get a better manager? Is Ten Hag the fourth best manager in the Premier League, in your opinion, says Olu. No, I, 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 I wouldn't even answer that question, mate, at the moment, because it's stupid. And um, I don't, I, I, you know, Ten Hag's not the fourth best manager in the Premier League at the moment. He was the third best manager in the Premier League last year. I don't know what he is at the moment, because I don't think, um, I, I, I don't think it's, really easy to define what he is at the moment because we're, we're such a mess. Um, we're not doing another Ten Hag in or out poll, United, we stand, because you know what? They're happening every day at the moment. Um, it's about 67% Ten Hag in and 33% Ten Hag out. Um, we did it yesterday. We did it Monday. No, we did it yesterday. We did it Sunday. So I'm not doing another one at the moment because what's changed from yesterday? Um, I need to talk to you about Dan Ashworth. Uh, it, this fits in nicely with what, uh, what 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 somebody just said there about what will happen in the summer. Uh, it's really difficult. Um, I mean, look, I, I would say that I've always felt that Tadebo will come to Manchester United. I think that's nailed on. Um, I'd keep an eye on Gwehi now as well from Crystal Palace. If Dougie Friedman's coming from there, I could really see that happening. Alisi as well, you can see that happening. And obviously we've got Wan Bissaka that could go back to Crystal Palace. So I'd be very surprised if we get Doogie Friedman, which it looks like we're going to, we don't sign at least one Crystal Palace player. So I would say that will happen. I think Tadebo will happen. But really, it does come down to what happens with the director of football. We are not looking like having a director of football in place this summer transfer window. The latest, and this is from a North East correspondent, is that Newcastle are confident of getting up to £20 million out of Manchester United for Dan Ashworth. Um, this report, which I read about an hour before we came live, basically says um, Newcastle, I think, and some of you might know, I seem to, I think Bournemouth's director of football has left. And there's talk that he's going to Newcastle, which is interesting, isn't it? But... Newcastle are working on their replacement for Dan Ashworth because they want to get working on the summer. But Newcastle are adamant that they do not want Dan Ashworth to work for Manchester United this summer transfer window. They're absolutely heels in the sand. We will not be moved on this. And yet there's still talk of 20 million. And some people are like, why, would, why are we paying tens of millions of pounds to Newcastle for a director of football that won't even be here in the summer? And the bottom line is... Because for some reason, baffling, there is apparently a contract with clauses in it that if Dan Ashworth leaves Newcastle, he can't go to another club for two years or 18 months. So we're sort of locked in this situation here. And, and you, in a way, so I, I saw somebody on Twitter today and they made a good point. Why have we gone all in on Dan Ashworth when we knew that this thing was there? Like... Why have we done that? There are other good director of footballs out there. Why have we gone for Dan Ashworth if it's such a difficult barrier deal to do? And it's a pretty big barrier when you've got to pay tens of millions of pounds to get a director of football that won't start until after the summer. I mean, you'd almost say that's reason not to do it. But look, we'll see what happens with the negotiations. But if it looks like Newcastle will not move on him working for us this summer and on top of that they want considerable compensation so worst case scenario we could end up paying Newcastle 20 million pounds and Dan Ashworth won't start as our director of football until after the summer well this is this is crazy money I think Sir Jim Radcliffe said it himself it's absolutely crazy money isn't it I mean we paid we paid less than that for Malassia and, and a director of football is important. I mean, if you if you watch the Anthony video this afternoon, I started on about the price tag and how we massively, massively overpaid. And if Dan Ashworth had done the Anthony deal and got him for 50, he saved 30 million. So straight away, he's, he's worth 20, isn't he? But it's a, it, is a, it is a mess. And um, 
I nearly said the name of the person there. I was speaking to a journalist yesterday about this and um, two plus two would have been four then because you would have figured out who the journalist was who told me this stuff last night, which would have been a right slip up. But I was speaking to a journalist yesterday and we were talking about Dan Ashworth and he said, at the moment, it's just really, really up in the air. Um, Man United really want Dan Ashworth. Dan Ashworth wants the Man United job. They're not going to go for anybody else now. It will be Dan Ashworth. But United are locked into this weird situation where Newcastle are just not going to let him start for Man United this summer. And Man United obviously desperately want him now. Um, and Newcastle are holding out for millions of pounds for him to start after the summer. So watch this space. But um, it, 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 is a, it, is, it is an odd one. Um, when you look at how smooth Barada was and you look at how smooth this Doogie Friedman deal probably will be as well. Uh, Mr. Fred says, is it possible that some of us have become blind to Ten Hag's shortcomings due to our despair over the managerial changes? I don't know anymore, says Mr. Zahi. Um, I, I think you make a good point. Again, well done. I think you make a good point. I mean, I said it last night. I don't think the manager should be replaced. I mean, I do look at what Arteta's done at Arsenal and I think, you know, there's a real blueprint there. And Ten Hag is bringing through young players. Um I saw a very good clip today, actually. It was an Ajax training session with Ten Hag. And the players are knocking the ball around for long periods of time. It's basically like two teams of eight in a small box. And they're knocking the ball around first touch. And there's eight people trying to defend. It's really, 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 really good. A really good drill. And then there's a clip of Man United trying to do it. And you can see certain players and they just can't do it. And... It's almost like, in a, in a comparison, you can see why we can't play like Ajax. We don't have the players. We don't have the players. Um, and that's a very good point. Like, give him the players. We're going to need these players anyway because we want to play a better style of football. So we're going to buy these players anyway. So let Ten Hag have a go with them. However, I do look at the league table and I go, 11 losses is a lot. You know, it, it's basically, it's more than one in three. Um because we haven't played 33 games yet. So 11 losses is more than one in three. Uh, we don't draw games, though. That's why we're not in a terrible position. We don't draw games. Um, but 11 losses isn't good enough. Um, and, you know, as I said last night, he's got three games to save his career, I think. Well, I know. Um, and that's right. Because two of those games, we should be winning. Uh, Larry, thanks for your super chat. Loan Anthony to Newcastle for a season as payment, says Thomas. They wouldn't want him, I don't think. Um, when Marcus Rashford got suspended, Rashford lost his form. Last season, Mark Marcus Rashford finds it again. Then the talk was Mason Greenwood's coming back. Marcus Rashford loses form again. They were close friends. I truly think it affected Marcus Rashford. But for me, he definitely stays, says Damo. Um, you know, You know what? I mentioned Sancho because he's friends with Rashford. Paul Ince said something to us on the show once. He said, I was on the golf course with Giggsy. I'm happy. I'm happy at Man United. I'm loving life. Sir Alex Ferguson turns up and says, we've sold you to Inter. I moved to Inter and all my mates I had at United, we don't really talk anymore because I'm now playing for Inter. Uh, and he said, look, in football, your friends come and go. It's not that they're not your friends, but, you you know, you go to a different dressing room and they're your mates because you're playing with them. Football's a real transient sport. You know, Harry Kane last season was mates with all the Spurs players. He's on his own at a new club at Bayern Munich playing football, scoring goals. If Marcus Rashford or any other Man United player is struggling for form this season because one of their mates got treated badly, that's a mentality issue. And we keep talking about this. You can't be a top-level footballer that loses form because one of your mates isn't getting picked. It might, be, it might be a reason. I doubt it. That's ridiculously weak mentality. If you, if you're, if you play for Man United or any other club and you, your justification for not playing well is you're not happy that the way your mate's been treated. You're, profes you're a highly professional sportsman earning massive money. You can't have that. You, play, you, you can't have that, surely. This is my view on Rashford and his form, says Damo. Please don't attack me for it. I've given this view often, but get shut down every single time. Here goes. And that was it. Um, 
Ali says we won't get a better manager than Ten Hag. Okay. Uh, Daniel, thank you very much for your super chat there. Let me go to the chat. Um, Mario G says, not necessarily, Mark. Lissandro Martinez and Edison Ed Alvarez are still mates and keep in touch. Uh, Mario, I don't know whether you've got, like, you need to clean your ears out. At no point did I say that Paul Ince said when he left Man United he wasn't friends with people anymore. What he said is, like, you move into a different dressing room, you're a professional sportsman, and you become mates with those people. I didn't say that he fell out with the United players. What I'm saying is, your best if you play for Man United and you move to Inter Milan, you, you're not playing golf with Giggsy anymore, are you? You're playing golf with whoever plays for Inter Milan. Like, friendships come and go. doesn't mean that you're not still friends, but, you, you know, you're not socialising with them anymore because you're playing for another club. And that's what I mean. That's what prof professional sport's all about. You will have friends and you will stay in touch in the modern day, obviously, on WhatsApp and Zooms and stuff like that. But you can't let it impact your form. And you can't be, you know, a top-level player who... Let me put it this way. If Roy Keane was best friends with Paul Ince and Sir Alex sold him to Inter, did Roy Keane stop playing well for Man United? No. Ryan Giggs was best friends with, with, with Paul Ince. Sir Alex sold him. The next season, we won the double. Did Ryan Giggs down tools? Did he get, did he get the ump? Oh, you sold Incey. No, that's what I'm talking about. Maybe Ryan Giggs wasn't happy that Paul Ince got sold. You know, they were good mates. But he's a professional sportsman. Like... Everybody else just gets on with it and, and plays for Manchester United or whatever club they play for. Um, what do you think about Nagelsmann, says Daniel? Um, I think he's the best of the of the bunch available in the summer, but I still think he's a massive risk. And I also think that it would be terrifying to bring Nagelsmann in in mid-July because that's when he'd come in. You know, that's when he would come in. Um it would be terrifying to bring the Gelsman in mid, in mid July and have him walk into a dressing room full of players that should have been sold and murder signings. So yeah, it, it, the Gelsman's the one I would go for if I had to choose, but it, it just doesn't work. It, it really doesn't work. Uh, Jacob, I feel like we're going around the houses here. Why? Why? Why are you saying Zidane? Like, never mention Zidane again. Like, you'll get slaughtered in the chat. Zidane is not real. Oh, well, he is real. He's a real person. Not a real... Sometimes he played like he was a robot, but Zidane is not a real option for Manchester United or Newcastle or Chelsea. In fact, I think if Zidane was going to go anywhere in the Premier League, he'd go to Chelsea. London club, Cosmopolitan. But he won't. He's not. He doesn't want to manage in the Premier League. Hi, Mark. If any of us are really thinking of changing the manager, Inzaghi would be a good option. Nah. I don't, I, Abdul, I don't, I think it's too, I, I wouldn't even say Inzaghi's a hipster choice. I'd say Inzaghi is a thinking person's choice. But it doesn't work for me. I, I don't think it works. It, I just have a bad feeling about that. It doesn't work. And what people need to remember is you're replacing a manager that many of us believe with his players back and a proper structure will be a lot better next season. You don't have to do it, is what I'm trying to say. People are, you know, Inzaghi to me is just like, you've got to do something. Ooh, we've got to do something. Let's try Inzaghi. You don't have to do it. Like, it's a really good point. You don't have to sack Ten Hag. In fact, most of us say you shouldn't do it. But people are going round going, oh, Inzaghi. What about Inzaghi? Oh, oh, what about, what about, what about De Zerbi? Ooh, we don't have to do it. People are throwing names out that are big risks. We don't have to take that risk. And as I said before, the big, big problem with Ineos is if they sack Ten Hag, a lot of people won't agree with it. And that's one on their record. If they give Inzaghi the job and he's absolutely terrible, that's two sackings in their first 18 months. That looks terrible. Really terrible. Um, so they've got all this to think about. Of course they have. Um, Arthur Morgan says the Ten Hag stand. Well, it, well, Arthur, it can't be the Ten Hag stand because we were actually the only outlet to reveal that he's only got he's only got three games to save his job. So, so by definition, it can't be the Ten Hag stand because we put something out there that no one's put out there, and I know it's true. So, how can it be the Ten Hag stand? If I if it was the Ten Hag stand, I'd have kept my mouth shut because no one else has got that information. 
So if we, if, we, if we were the Eric Ten Hag stand, then I wouldn't put it out there because it just puts him under pressure. And it puts a big red target on him. So what, it, what, what you're confusing it is, is with a community where anything is open to be discussed and any opinion is allowed, but my opinion isn't your opinion. I mean, if I had a pound for every, every time somebody said, I thought this was meant to be out about opinion. It is. It always has been about opinion. The problem is some of you don't like my opinion, which is I wouldn't sack the manager. But he's got three, three games to save his job. And even if he saves his job from those three games, the next three games are really tough. So, you know, it's um, of course it's up in the air. Of course it's up in the air. And if he lost his next three games, even I would sit there and say, you know, the players have done it again. Of course he's got to go. Um, best option is Simone uh, or Inzaghi, says Larry. I mean, look, Atletico Madrid play a better brand of football now than they ever have. Um, Simone, you know, I've, Simeone is somebody that I've, I've never really wanted, but they do, they, they are a bit different now that they're not as defensive as they were, but it's a big risk again. It's a big, big risk. Any word on Ineos selling Nice, says Zero Connection? No. And OG says, let's give the details their devils their due. Let's say Eric Ten Hag deserves the sack. Who would come to United? Liverpool, Bayern and Barcelona are looking for a manager. It's ludicrous, says OG Dom. And um, Abdul said about Inzaghi. Uh, when do you see us challenging again, says Shah? Uh, good question again. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the show of great questions. Um you know what? I, I I think I tweeted it today and I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but when I saw us being linked to Doogie Friedman today, it just made me realise that's a big, big call. He's a director of football for Crystal Palace. He's never been near a big club, even in his career, let alone a director of football. He's going to come into the biggest job in world football at the moment um, and he's going to need time. He ain't going to hit the ground running. Dan Ashworth probably won't even be here this summer. That's time. Um, I think everywhere you look with Manchester United at the moment, all you can see is time. And, and and that's not a bad thing. You know, I'm not I'm not dismissing it. Ten years of repetitive bad mistakes could take ten years to put right. How long does it put how long does it take to correct a mistake? Is it like for like or can you do it quicker? Obviously, you can do it quicker. It's not going to take 10 years. But I do think it's going to take three, four, five years. If it works. If it works. And that's the big thing. I would say three years minimum if they get every decision right. If every appointment works and every transfer works, three years minimum. If they, you know, if Dougie Friedman fails or Ashworth fails or Barada fails or they buy badly again, the cycle continues. So I would say, even if they get everything right, three years. And I think you've got to look at Arsenal. There was a project with Arteta, eighth, eighth, second title race. Um, you're never going to go from this playing squad to challenging for the title next year. Never. I don't think you're going to go from this playing squad to challenge for, challenging for the title the season after next. I think you've got to look at the season after that. So three years, definitely. I have a five-year-old nephew. Well done. Uh, oh, there's more. He puts everything into his dancing and doesn't down tools. He's a child, but more mature than most United teams, says Damo. Thank you very much. Uh, but also, Daniel says, I want Ten Hag to stay, but the only way this works is if he gets control of the dressing room and gets rid of the snakes, says Daniel. Well, I'm not going to get into rumour because it's not right, but... Um, there are a number of people that have been saying for a long time that um, it will be the manager or certain players. And what I would say about those certain players is it will definitely be the manager. Read between the lines. It's only rumour, but there is rumour that there is a couple of players at United who will only be here next season if Ten Hag's not. And just because of who they are, I think, I, I, you know, I think it'll be a Glazer decision again, like Mourinho. 
Um, but I guess we'll see. Right, I'm doing Bayern Munich against Lazio on that spot. I'll tell you what, I love this design. It's great, isn't it? And it's not really, not really my thing, heavy metal, but I do I do like the design. Um, anyway, are you ready to rock? Uh, Bayern Munich. I said, are you ready to rock? We're not doing any rock. I'm just messing around. Um, we are on That's Football in five minutes' time for Bayern Munich against Lazio. If you want to tune in for that, absolutely you can. Um, it's not just going to be about football. I'll be answering um, a quite horrible tweet that was said about me last night. Um, some 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 OnlyFans twat passed on me, apparently. Well, my response will be coming on That's Football. And also, a website article today said I was five foot eight. So I'll be responding to that shit as well. I'll see you over there in a couple of minutes.